Let us say we abide in the word of God. And the word of God abides in us. We produce good fruit for the kingdom of God. The love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us now and forever. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So the last three points that we are going to cover, which are very crucial as we work out our salvation, are number one, unbelief. Let us all say unbelief. And then the second key point that we want to look at is the sinful nature. Let us all say the sinful nature. And then the last point that we want to look at, very briefly, is pride. Let us say pride. Hallelujah. We'll go to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. In Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1, the Bible says, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they had did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who had it. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he said, so I saw in my wrath that they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Hallelujah. There is a rest that God has reserved for those who believe in him. But uh, if we do not believe, we don't enter that rest. It's not a natural rest. It is a spiritual rest where we rest from striving, where we rest from striving, because this life is full of strife. I'm not saying striving in a positive sense, but I'm saying striving in terms of worry, strife. Let us say strife. Yes. If we don't have belief in God, there is a lot of strife that characterizes our lives. Hallelujah. But the Bible tells us that when God had completed his works, he actually rested, even though he is God. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. <clears throat> and again in this place, they shall not enter my rest, since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. In the first verse and the second verse, we are told that the reason why they didn't enter his rest is because they didn't mix the word of God with faith. So it didn't profit them. And then in verse 6, we are told that they disobeyed God. So one characteristic of unbelief is disobedience because it's impossible to obey God who is a spirit without first of all believing him hallelujah for God's word to benefit or profit us we must mix it with faith in our hearts faith means doing what the word of God says let us go to James chapter 2 James chapter 2 I'm going to read from verse 14. It says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. 
Hallelujah. So we see from those few verses that I've just read from James chapter 2, that faith is acting on what we believe. So the Bible shows us that uh, faith, it has to be accompanied by corresponding works. So if you believe in something and then whatever you believe in, you are not doing it. The Bible doesn't call that faith. I don't know what it is called. But in the Bible, it's not called faith. Because faith is always associated with work. Hallelujah. Because faith is an internal thing, just like hatred or love. You can't say that person hates me when they haven't done anything towards you. Hallelujah. You can only see hatred by the works of a person. Or envy. You can only see it from what they say and from what they do. You can't see all of these things. Envy, jealous, faith, hope, and so on. You can't see them because they are located inside the heart of a man. Hallelujah. We can only deduce them through the mobility of a person, the outward man their outward manifestation. You cannot claim that you are full of compassion, yet uh, externally we cannot see that compassion. Hallelujah. So faith means doing what the word of God says. Because when the word has been spoken, we have to act on the word. That's how we cooperate with God who is a spirit. If we don't act on the word of God, we can't talk of ourselves as having faith. That was the mistake of the people of Israel as they were journeying from Egypt to Canaan. Most of them had just theoretical faith because they were following Moses. But when the situation became tough, they started to crumble in the wilderness. Hallelujah. Let us go to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Let me read verse 3. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that men shall not live by bread alone. Man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So the Bible says God caused them to hang, so that they may know that man does not live on bread alone, but by each and every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Hallelujah. He, God caused the food to, to run out, because evidently when they came out of Egypt, they came out with food. They were carrying some supplies. But that food ran out as they were churning in the wilderness. Because Canaan was far away from Egypt. Hallelujah. So when, when the word of God comes to us, there is what is known as a wilderness test. Let us say a wilderness test. A wilderness test. Yes, there is a wilderness test. That's where most people fail. Because in the wilderness, uh, let me call it the desert test. Because what we know as a wilderness, sometimes what we call wilderness here in Africa, there will be a lot of water and vegetation. Let me say desert test. Let us say desert test. Desert test. Yes. There are instances when the word of God seems to be fruitless. And you just have to cling on the word of God by faith. Like the people of Israel, instead of crumbling and complaining, they were supposed to cling on the word of God by faith. That is how we secure our salvation. That is how we ensure our salvation. Because anything which you don't cling on to, it doesn't benefit you. It's like someone who is learning medicine. You don't become a medical doctor by attending just lectures for one semester. Hallelujah. If you attend attend lectures for one semester we can't call you a medical doctor you only become a medical doctor through you know and when you are attending lectures even when you are doing fifth year you don't get paid hallelujah even when you are doing year number five still you will be a student you are called a student you don't earn anything 
even if you are getting distinctions. Here I'm just showing us things in the natural. If you quit before you finish your fifth year or just before you write your final examination in the fifth year of doing medicine or engineering, you can't be called an engineer because you did almost all the courses. You have to do all the courses. Hallelujah. Amen. It's the same with spiritual matters. The reason why the word of God does not produce for many people is because many people, they give up too easily. Hallelujah. The word of God has to be tested in you. And the word of God has to test you. It has to be tested in us. Whether it is true. It is known from the Holy Scriptures that the word of God is true. Because God never lies. Let us say God never lies. Yeah, let us go to Numbers. Numbers chapter 23. Verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? So we know that God does not lie. It's impossible for God to lie. Because to lie, it means to deviate from the tr truth. If God, if God hypothetically were to lie, it would be in serious trouble because God is the source of everything. He's the source of justice, is the source of truth. If God were to start lying, we would never know the truth. Hallelujah. Here I'm just posing a philosophic hypothetical situation. If God were to lie, we know he cannot lie. If he were to lie, it would be very serious Trump. Because God is the standard of everything. Everything which you see around you, all the forces that operate, all the laws that operate in the physical world, be they laws of thermodynamics, be they hydraulic laws, be they whatever laws, biological laws, all of them they were created by God. Hallelujah. So if God were to say things which are not true, would be in serious trouble. It means the universe would just collapse. Because the universe is based on laws that have been in existence for billions, if not more than billions of years. Hallelujah. The whole universe, it rests on the word of God. Hallelujah. It rests on the word of God, the entire universe. So God is not a man that he should lie. No, a son of man that he should repent. What it simply means is that when God has purposed something in line with his nature, in line with his fundamental purposes, it doesn't change. What God has promised in his word will always come to pass. Your duty, my duty, is to embrace what God has said. Whether it appears to be true or it appears to be false, is something else, but we, you just have to cling to the word of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. We as Christians, we must cling to the word of God. We must not do like the Israelites in the wilderness. Most of them, they were, they were given to complaining. Hallelujah. Amen. They asked for meat and God gave them meat and afterwards they started complaining. Let us say the wilderness test. Yes, in the, because the reason why I'm sharing this message is because quite a number of us here are going through a wilderness. But a wilderness is not a final destination. Let us confess and say the desert situation is not my final destination. The desert situation is not my final destination. Yes, it's just a place. The reason why the wilderness is tough it's to help you to continue, to keep on moving. Because if the wilderness were comfortable, you would think you have arrived in the wilderness. The reason why the wilderness has got no comfort, the wilderness has no comfort so that we keep on moving. The situation where you are, the reason, the reason why conditions are tough is because God wants you to keep moving. There is a higher level that he has reserved in himself for you, that he wants you to faithful. So you have to keep on moving. 
You know when the people of Israel were moving from Egypt to Canaan, there is a place called Elim, which had an oasis, where they found water and some very nice trees. Some, some of them, they sort of settled in that place. They no longer wanted to move. But they were not in Canaan, you see. They had to be reminded that they had not yet arrived in Canaan. Hallelujah. And even when they arrived in Canaan, you know, it was not a stroll in the park. They found those, those tribes, those races of people who were, who were very tall and very huge. They had to exercise their faith to possess the land. So as Christians, we confront situations which are a challenge to our faith. Which are a challenge to our faith. And when you are facing a situation which is a challenge to your faith, what God will be doing, you will be checking whether you will believe his word. Because to believe God's word is to believe God. Let us confess and say to believe God's word is to believe God. Hallelujah. Let us confess and say to believe God's word is to believe God. Because God's word comes from God. It doesn't matter how it has come to us. It may, it came through the Bible, it came through people preaching. But the word of God is true. Hallelujah. This is what Jesus Christ said. Let us go to John chapter 14, verse 6. It says in verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is Jesus Christ. The reason why he was speaking like that is because Jesus Christ came to, to give us the word of God. And that is why in John chapter 1 verse 1, the, Jesus Christ is called the word. We know that Jesus Christ was not literally the word. He was a, a human being. But he was called the word because he came with a message for all of us. A message of salvation. Hallelujah. So it's very important for us to believe in Christ. It doesn't matter what you are going through. There may be a situation which is refusing to change. Like the wilderness. No matter how much fasting they could have done in the wilderness, there is no way in which the wilderness was going to become a rainforest. Because God never designed them to stay in the wilderness. They didn't have the grace to transform the wilderness into a rainforest. Sometimes we pray for the wilderness to change into a rainforest because we don't understand how God operates. The reason why you are in that situation is because God wants you to keep moving. Let us confess and say, I will keep moving. Yes, here we are not talking about physical movement. We are talking about the walk of faith. The walk of faith is a walk. We don't stagnate, even in our minds. We keep on believing in Christ. We keep on believing in God that he is with us. Hallelujah. Let us confess and say God is with me. I will keep moving. And you must not brood over the past. The only thing which you need to learn from the past is not to repeat the past. Hallelujah. If you did good in the past, you must do better in the present. If you were doing better things in the past, you must do best things in the present. Hallelujah. Because those who don't learn from the past, they are condemned to repeat it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So unbelief is the opposite of faith. And um, it's a bit funny that many Christians are actually full of unbelief. Because Christians are also called believers in the Bible. Just imagine 
a believer who is an unbeliever at the same time. Who when they see a miracle of healing, they will say it's the devil who has performed the miracle. They will say this person is a satanist. Most of the people who criticize the supernatural on the internet and everywhere are actually Christians. Yes. They will Most of the people who believe in the supernatural are not even Christians. Yes. Just imagine someone has never read the Bible. And maybe they don't even follow the Bible. But when something is supernatural, they are able to see it. They don't argue with it. And then you find someone who is a bishop who trained for seven years to be a bishop, giving you a rational explanation that ah, this is, is tricks. These are tricks. And then if they realize that it's not a trick, then they look for a dark power to ascribe that to. They will tell you, ah, these are powers of Satanism. When they can't explain anymore, they will tell you, ah, these are satanic powers. And then the question which I have, why is it everything which is powerful is ascribed to satan? And all things which are empty and which are weak are ascribed to God. Because if you, tell, if you always want me or fake miracles, why not show me the, the real ones, the genuine ones? Hallelujah. Because you can't have a fake something without a genuine something. Otherwise, the fake will be original. <laughs> if all that there is is just fake things, then you don't have fake things anymore. You have got original things which look fake. Hallelujah. Because there are some original things which are inferior, which look fake. The reason why we are mentioning this point it's because many Christians, on a daily basis, they are always blocking their prayers by commenting on things which they don't understand. Just like the people of Israel in the wilderness. They were murmuring against Moses. At one point, they were challenging Moses. Hey, Moses, who appointed you to be leader over us? But it's Moses who freed them from Egypt. He's the one who stretched forth his rod of miracles to open the Red Sea after talking to God. But they were challenging his position. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. The people who were challenging the position of Moses were not non-believers. They were Jews. We had witnessed the ten plagues in Egypt. They had seen the ten plagues in Egypt. But still they challenged the position of Moses. Hallelujah. Amen. One of the main weapons that the devil uses against the children of God is unbelief. Hallelujah. Amen. Let us all say unbelief. unbelief. Unbelief is a situation where the Bible says something and we are saying another thing which is opposite of what the Bible is saying. Hallelujah. 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 You know, let me read Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55. Uh, maybe before Isaiah 55, let me read Isaiah 53 verse 4. It says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Let us say by his stripes we are healed. This is Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, who was saying this long before Jesus Christ was born. Let us go to Isaiah 55. It says, My thoughts, I'm reading from verse 8. My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down, and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be, that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing 
for which I sent it. According to God, this word is always has results. Hallelujah. The word of God always has results. The only place where the word of God can be defeated in terms of results is in a human heart. When the human heart is full of unbelief. On the one hand, we will be yearning for supernatural intervention from God. On the other hand, we will be criticizing miracles. So what do you want? Look at your neighbor and say, what do you want? When people see people who have been healed of cancer, supernatural, they say, ah, this is satanism. Now, they are quick to say this is satanism. They've never seen satan. They've never seen Satan because Satanism is a movement to glorify Satan. Most people will be saying this, this is the work of demons. They've never even seen a demon. They don't know how a demon looks, looks like. Hallelujah. They will tell you this is witchcraft. They've never even seen a witch. They don't know a witch. Maybe their best friends may be witches and wizards. Hallelujah. They tell you this is witchcraft. Let us say unbelief. Let us say unbelief. Yes, unbelief is it's a weapon that the devil used against the Israelites in the wilderness. Another word for unbelief is disbelief. Let us say disbelief. Yes, so uh, we must believe God. We must believe God at all times. Hallelujah. We must believe God. And then the second point that I want to cover is um, the sinful nature. What is called the flesh in the Bible? Let us say the flesh. Yes. Uh, let us go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. I'm going to read from verse 3. It says, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So, it's very possible to walk according to the flesh. And, and many people, including Christians, said, are walking by, uh, according to the flesh, not according to the spirit. And there are people who walk according to the spirit. Now, one painful thing is that if Christians don't walk according to the spirit, People like Muslims and so on, Hindus, they will be walking in the spirit. Hallelujah. They are very spiritual. Extremely spiritual. Uh, there is a certain book where I read a certain story about missionaries who went to preach in India, in a certain village in India. These missionaries, they had cramped the Bible. They, they had just graduated from Bible school. Dan missiology, Dan angelology, all of those ology which are just not useful <laughs> when you meet Indians who are deep in Hinduism. Hallelujah. So when they arrived in this village, um, they were carrying books which have got the image of Christ. And then everyone in that village accepted Christ. These people... They were, they were sending letters back to America and other countries where they were coming from. That people have converted to Christ. You can't believe people, all the people were saying it's tough to preach the gospel in India. They didn't understand. Hallelujah. Whenever they did meetings, people would come, they would sing whatever songs they were teaching them. They would learn those songs. Hallelujah. And then they decided one day, some of these missionaries, that let us visit these people in their homes. They discovered that these people had made a caricature of Jesus. Some had made a caricature of Gabriel, all of these characters that are in the Bible. 
a caricature of Stephen, and they were worshipping these caricatures. Like the curios, you know the curios, which you buy from City Hall, they made something like the curios of Jesus, and they were worshipping it. And then, <laughs> some of them, they had put the caricature of Jesus inside the Hindu, whatever, shrine. And they, they were bringing vegetables every morning to that caricature. To them, these people, these missionaries who were preaching, had come with a collection of gods for them to add to the uncons. So they realized we are joking here. We haven't started. So they fasted. After fasting and praying, they decided to do a crusade because they had converted the village by doing door to door. They decided now we are going to do a crusade. That's where they saw almost the devil first to first. These Hindu priests, they came. We had never actually converted. They came from that village and from adjoining villages. And they said, you are telling us that your Jesus is the king of kings. We want to show you, they mentioned to the uncounts, that whatever courts we are following are also king of kings as well. They levitated the temple and put it in the air. And they said, if your Jesus can bring the temple down, we will follow your Jesus. The Christians, they prayed, the temple couldn't move. <laughs> because they had never met such kind of opposition in Western countries. They tried to pray, these, these magicians were busy laughing, seated, I mean, they were busy laughing at them. Hallelujah. 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 So they become seriously offended. They almost backslid all of them. Because they couldn't do anything to the temple. The Hindus had to bring down their temple. Yes. So now, one of them returned to, to America. I won't mention his name. He became a very great evangelist. But he's now late. It's his daughter that is now preaching. Hallelujah. You know, they fasted. You know, they sought the face of God. Some of those brothers and sisters, they returned back to that village. You know, and then these people, they did the same trick of lifting a temple using powers of Satanism. And then, because these people now had faith in their heart, they were no longer walking in the flesh, while just claiming to be walking in the spirit. They commanded in the name of Jesus that temple did not only come down, it actually crashed onto the ground. Yes, so we have to walk in the spirit. When we are doing things of the spirit, we must walk in the spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. You can't mix the things of the spirit with the things of the flesh. The reason why Christianity appears to be so ineffective, yet it ought to be the most powerful uh, system of worship, it's because now it's mixed with a lot of intellectualism. Hallelujah. It's mixed with a lot of intellectualism. The simplicity of Christianity, which is just reading the word of God, believing in it, having constant communion with God, and constantly desiring the presence of God. These things have been forsaken, and people have invented too many doctrines which cause them to, to, to hate one another. Instead of just reading the word of God with simplicity, receiving it with simplicity in our heart, meditating on the word of God. And when we do that, God will begin to produce miracles. But God will never produce miracles to support your own doctrine. Hallelujah. He will produce miracles to support his word. What he has said is in his word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we need to walk in the spirit. If you walk into India, walking in the flesh, you will be in serious trouble. Hallelujah. You may end up con converting to Hinduism. Because those people, they will do things which you can't understand. They will start to levitate and float in the sky. Float in the, in the air. And you won't understand what's going on. You will end up saying, but I've never seen such powers in Christianity. 
Maybe this thing, there is wisdom in this thing. Hallelujah. In Western countries, if you go to Western countries, many Christians, they mix Christianity with the Zen Buddhism and all of these Eastern philosophies. Because the problem is that we church leaders and other eminent Christians, they, we don't live in the spirit. We are living in the flesh. And so Christians are not seeing the supernatural. It's not uncommon in a Christian school to find Christians teaching each other yoga. The word yoga, is, it's a Hindi word which means to yoke with. Yoga, it means to yoke someone with the Brahmin, the, the supreme court of the Hindus. You see. Hallelujah. So, but you'll find Christians sitting in the lotus position, you know, saying they are balancing things. You, you only need to balance things using the word of God, not by sitting in a lotus position. Hallelujah. But we know that the reason why all of these things are happening in the church is because as Christians, we are not walking in the spirit. We spend most of our time in the flesh, even in church. We have got so many substitutes for doing things in the spirit. Hallelujah. We have got so many activities, so many parties, so many activities, so many, there are even, in some, in some ministries, you even find Christians having time for gigs inside the church. When will we convert Muslims? Because they don't have gigs in mosques. You see. If they watch some of our videos on YouTube, I was talking to a certain brother who learned for five years in Algeria. Yeah, he was doing engineering in Algeria. He was telling me that, you know, some of those Algerians, they were saying, your religion, when we are reading your books, they say the Bible, you know, it's a book and other Christian books. They say it, it sounds very powerful, but the main challenge that we have is that we don't leave the things which are in your book. That's what the Muslims were saying. Because Algeria is, I think it's more than 90% Muslim. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They were saying you compromise a lot. These Algerians who are Muslims. They were saying, ah, you are not even serious. So they were calling them unbelievers. They said, if you really believed in what you are doing, we could call you alternative believers. But because you don't even believe in, in the book that you claim to be following, we just call you infidels. Because an infidel is someone who doesn't believe. A ethan. It's, a, it's a, another way of saying a ethan. Hallelujah. So we have to walk in the spirit. Let us go to Galatians. Chapter 5, verse 16. It says, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So the flesh, the sinful nature, because when it says the flesh, it's not talking about the meat part of your body. Though most sins are actually meant to satisfy or to tingle the meat part of a human being. Most sins, hallelujah, most sins that people do, they actually please the, the body part of a human being. We know a human being is not really a pot. It's a spirit, possesses a soul, and lives in a, in a pot. <laughs> because when a human being has died, when we are looking at his corpse, people, they say the corpse of so-and-so. So the question is, who is so-and-so?